Hello, I'm Dr. Claire Francomano from the Indiana University School of Medicine, and it is my great pleasure to present to you today on autoimmune disease and the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. I would like to thank the Ehlers-Danlos Society for the opportunity to participate in today's ECHO Summit. I would like to say before we get started that I wanted to entitle this talk, Autoimmune Disease and the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes and Hypermobility Spectrum Disorders. However, there's literally nothing in the literature that I could find about autoimmune conditions and HSD. Hence, my discussion today will be limited to what we know about autoimmune conditions in the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. These are my disclosures. I'm sure this audience needs no reminder that the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes present with manifestations in virtually every organ system in the body. Dr. Heidi Collins, who's a member of the Medical and Scientific Board for the Ehlers-Danlos Society and has cared for thousands of patients with EDS in her career, famously said, if you can't connect the issues, think connective tissues. The same might be said for the autoimmune disorders of which there are hundreds and collectively affect every organ system in the body. My goal for the next 20 minutes or so is to look at the literature at the overlap between the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and the autoimmune conditions writ large. This paper, which was published by Rogers and colleagues in 2016, is the only one I could find that directly addresses an association between the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and rheumatic diseases. The authors did a retrospective chart review of patients seen at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, which is a tertiary care center serving populations in New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, upstate New York, and Vermont. They used ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes to identify patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and chart reviews to confirm that a diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome was made. This was before the 2017 criteria, so it was uh, the previous incarnation of the diagnostic criteria. They sorted the patients into categories, those that received no workup, those that received the limited workup, and those that received a comprehensive workup with detailed serologic markers after the diagnosis of EDS was made. This list was compiled by comparing the frequency of rheumatologic conditions in the group that received the comprehensive workup to general population frequency numbers that they determined from the literature. A methodologic concern about this is that they limited their denominator by focusing on the group that only got a comprehensive workup, which would be a highly selected group that was um, worked up with serologic testing because of suspicion of autoimmune disease. So the true prevalence of these conditions in EDS is not really evident from their data. In the highly worked up group, however, they did see a significantly higher prevalence in HEDS compared to the general population of primary hypogammaglobulinemia, hereditary angioedema, fibromyalgia, and erythromyalgia, and then the uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases of uh, TRAPS, systemic lupus, rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, and pernicious anemia, uh, inflammatory eye disease, Crohn's disease, autoimmune thyroiditis, and ankylosing spondylitis. So given the methodologic limitations, um, it is the only paper out there that directly addresses this issue. So I thought it was worthwhile to mention. One approach to sort of trying to get past the methodologic concerns would be a prospective study examining all patients diagnosed with HEDS over a specific period of time for evidence of autoimmune disease. Or one could uh, search the databases similar to the uh, effort that this group did 
to uh, look for those diagnosed with specific autoimmune conditions and then search for concurrent diagnoses of EDS to see whether EDS is overrepresented in those groups. So um, those are some things that could be done, but this is, I would say, preliminary sort of interesting information. This study uh, by Ryda Dingra and her colleagues uh, looked at prescription claims for immunomodulator and anti-inflammatory drugs among persons with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes in a large data set of prescription claims from private insurers. This one has a limitation that patients on Medicaid and Medicare and the uninsured are not included in the analysis but here again, we're looking, we're limited to the available data, so it's worth taking a look at what's out there. Dingra and colleagues divided the immunomodulator and anti-inflammatory drugs into categories as illustrated on the next slide. The big groups of drugs were the non-biologic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, biologic agents, and there were subclasses within each group representing specific drugs that are listed in the third column in this table. For the analysis, this paper reports a comparison between the prescription claims for at least one immunomodular medication in cases with EDS and in controls, as well as the prescription claims in each of the large drug groups. In each case, they reported significantly higher numbers of claims as compared to closely matched controls in the same data set. Now, there are a lot of caveats to the interpretation of this data. The drug claims are being used as a proxy for the presence of rheumatologic and immunologic disease, but just because the drugs were prescribed for a rheumatologic condition does not necessarily mean that the patient had that rheumatologic condition. They could be being used off-label or the physician may have made an inaccurate diagnosis and ascribed the patient's pain to a rheumatologic condition when the underlying cause was actually muscular or neurologic pain due to their EDS. We don't have the serologic data for these patients. But it is one additional piece of evidence suggesting that there may be a overrepresentation of rheumatologic autoimmune conditions in the EDS population. So those two papers address the direct relationship between autoimmune conditions and EDS in general. Now we have a series of papers looking at autoimmunity in some of the conditions we recognize as comorbid with EDS. This paper from Japan discusses the association between POTS and autoantibodies to the ganglionic acetylcholine receptor. The authors found antibodies in the sera from 29% of patients with POTS and also noted that autoimmune markers and comorbid in autoimmune disease were also frequent in the seropositive POTS patients. We know there is a significant overlap between POTS and EDS. There are studies out there suggesting that perhaps as many as a third of POTS patients may have EDS, and certainly POTS is very highly prevalent among the EDS population. What we don't know is the proportion of patients with EDS and POTS who have these circulating autoantibodies. That's a study that is yet to be done. So in the previous presentation, you heard from Dr. Maitland about immune dysfunction in the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. This paper is a case for Report describing hypogammaglobulinemia and fibromyalgia in a patient with EDS. The paper discusses new classification and the diagnosis and multidisciplinary management needed for such patients. Here again, we know there is significant overlap between fibromyalgia and EDS. 
Many of my patients were diagnosed with fibromyalgia before they came to be diagnosed with EDS. And myofascial pain and tender points typical of fibromyalgia are highly prevalent in people with EDS. So this is a really fascinating study, which was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation just last year, suggesting that fibromyalgia may have an autoimmune component. The authors describe a study in which uh, serum was collected from patients with fibromyalgia and healthy control subjects. They isolated immunoglobulin, IgG, and then that IgG was injected into mice. And what they found was that the IgG from patients with fibromyalgia caused increased pain-like behavior in the mice, mechanical and cold hypersensitivity. They reduced their locomotion. So if you see all the way on the right-hand side, the um, movement of a mouse around the cage is described after the injection with IgE from healthy controls. And you can see that there's much more movement around the, around the cage than for the mice that receive the IgG from a patient with fibromyalgia. The mice injected with serum from fibromyalgia patients also demonstrated increased nociceptor excitability, and they had reduced innervation in their skin, and the antibodies demonstrated binding to satellite glial cells and neurons. So this is really an intriguing um, observation or set of observations and suggests that fibromyalgia may have an autoimmune component. Here again, the connection between these antibodies and the antibody and the prevalence of fibromyalgia or fibromyalgia-like symptoms in EDS is something that is yet to be determined. This is another case report, in this case describing a patient with autoimmune small fiber neuropathy and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, who was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin. In my practice, I'm seeing an increasing number of patients with EDS who have suspected a small fiber neuropathy. How many of these actually are found to have this diagnosis on skin biopsy, and how many of those have an autoimmune cause are still open questions. This paper, which was published in the French literature, discussed the diagnostic strategy to small fiber neuropathy and the most common autoimmune causes for that condition. Moving now to the GI tract. This is a paper from Leszkowska and colleagues who examined the nation, nationwide population-based cohort of people with celiac disease, and that they found that the incidence of EDS or joint hypermobility uh, syndrome, which they, they were unable to separate those out in their data set, but in that combined uh, group of EDS and uh, joint hypermobility syndrome, um, it was 14 per 100,000 person years in their cohort with celiac disease compared to nine patient years, nine per 100,000 person years in the reference cohort. And this corresponded to a hazard ratio of 1.49. So um, the population of patients with celiac disease were slightly more likely to have a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome than the reference cohort. For a further discussion about inflammatory bowel disease and um, Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, I recommend Dr. Matthew Hamilton's GI presentation this afternoon. He'll be discussing IBD versus mast cell activation as very different inflammatory conditions. 
When we think of a list of conditions which are comorbid with autoimmune disease, it looks very familiar to those of us who care for patients with EDS, right? So these are this is the list uh, that are considered comorbid with autoimmune conditions, including chronic fatigue syndrome, complex regional pain syndrome, eosinophilic esophagitis, gastritis, Raynaud's phenomenon, and primary immunodeficiency. So we recognize that many of these are very highly represented in the ehlers danlos population as well. Here again, no direct correlations and certainly causation is not, not out there yet, but there are associations. So based on this quick overview and a review of the literature, these are the organs in which there is at least preliminary evidence recognizing the limitations of the studies of an autoimmune process associated with EDS. Um, based on the sparsity of the literature and the methodologic limitations of the published studies, there's still really a tremendous amount of work to do in this field. So just a few thoughts about why might people at, uh, with EDS be at increased risk for autoimmune conditions. You've heard from Dr. Maitland about immune dysregulation in EDS, and it's Autoimmunity is a dysregulation of the immune system for sure. So it's possible that, that immune dysregulation is contributing to uh, the development of autoimmune conditions in the population with EDS. There are also some very interesting observations over really it's the last 20 years or so, starting with Dr. Diana Bianchi, um, who looked at maternal fetal cell trafficking. So cells that travel between the mom and the baby during pregnancy. We know that this happens and um, the cells move, move both ways between from mom to baby and back uh, from baby to mom. And those cells carry DNA that is not, quote, self to the mom or to the baby. And it's possible that those cells may then set off an uh, immune reaction where the immune system recognizing those non-self cells develops autoimmunity to the um, fetal or maternal cells. And one of the risk factors for increased fetal cell trafficking is pathology in the placenta, which is largely made up of connective tissue. So it's possible that people with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, women with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes have placenta that are more uh, likely to allow trafficking between the mom and the baby more likely to allow in those nine self cells and therefore more likely to develop autoimmune reactions. We don't know. And there may be other possible explanations. Um, I think the first step is going to be to establish uh, using some methodologically sound studies, whether there is indeed a connection between the autoimmune conditions and the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and then uh, really careful think about what the underlying causation might be would follow from that. So when I thought about how to wrap this all up and summarize the state of the science regarding EDS and the autoimmune conditions, the e-newsletter from the Ehlers-Danlos Society came to mind, Loose Connections. There are loose connections in the literature between EDS and the autoimmune disorders. Our job now is to tighten those up and ascertain the true prevalence of autoimmune disorders in the EDS and HSD populations in order to facilitate accurate diagnoses and optimal management for all of our patients. And I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to Dr. Alan Hakeem, who really helped me pull this study, this uh, presentation together. 
uh, Dr. Laura Bloom and the Ellis Danlos Society. Thank you so very much.